Okay, guys. Welcome. This is Demystifying Whatever. I'm Jason Yoder. I'm going to work with you guys today. Who's been in one of my sessions already? Good. You know what to do, everybody. Look like you actually are having fun. One, two, three. All right, for the, the ones who put up the middle finger, let's no, I'm kidding. You know, I really should look at those pictures before I post them because I don't know what y'all are doing in the background. All right, guys, so let me introduce myself a little bit. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. I specialize in delivering Windows Server, and of course, my most popular class is PowerShell. Before I came out here, I delivered my 79th PowerShell class. I've been doing this since version one. How many of you have ever done BB Script before? Hi, Tom. I know you have. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you can even remember? Oh, I gotta put my hand up on that one. How many of you can remember how to use VBScript? Liars. Anyhow. <laughs> All right, so guys, really, I've been doing this for a long time. My degree is in computer science, but by trade, I'm a network administrator, which really mends well with PowerShell. I know how to write code and I know how to manage a system. What's really cool about my job is that every week I've got a lot of environments I've never touched before and all those problems land on my plate. Did I mention I teach classes? I, this is not consulting, but you know what? We come up with some really odd solutions at times. But I also get a lot of weird questions. There's a lot of little hidden gems in PowerShell. These little gems, of course, are not for everybody. That's why many of you probably haven't seen them yet. But I'm just going to show a few of the weird ones that have popped up in my classes over the last few years. And maybe I can give you guys a little hint on how to improve code or do something that you've already been or wanting to work with. So we've got a couple of items we're going to try and cover here over the next, what, 45 minutes or so before, you know, I die here from, you know, Wicked Witch's Hourglass. I'm seriously not referencing you, really. Okay, so let's play around a little bit here. As soon as I can find my code. There we go. And of course, guys, remember all the code. Don't worry about writing it down. I'm going to give you a link at the end of the show so you can download it. Who was in our last session where I forgot to do the code, the link? I put the link on the final slide so you'll get that one as well, okay? We did like 14, 1,500 lines of code, so I noticed people are having trouble writing it all down. So, okay, so how many of you write your own PowerShell commandlets? Some of you, okay. Well, came across a little quirky thing here the, um, a few weeks ago. And, uh, well, first of all, let's just uh, just show you what a function looks like. I probably should have called this advanced function because it is. This is what a PowerShell function or what will become a command that looks like. Now, there's three different components to this, a begin, a process, and the end. What does the begin section do for you? It runs once. Yeah, remember these commandlets, they're all talking to each other in the PowerShell pipeline. That's all done for you. And when this commandlet sees something's about to come to it from its, uh, the next commandlet up in the pipeline, it's going to execute whatever's in the begin block. The process section runs for each object that you send it. And then when my test basic function looks up and sees nothing else coming through the pipeline, it runs the end section. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's put this into memory. And let's just kind of, you know, we probably can split it this way. There we go. Sorry, guys. Had to literally run across. Oops. Had to literally run across the building. Why are you being this way? Literally ran across the building to make it over here in time for this presentation. There we go. There. Now we can see what's happening on the left side of the screen. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and put this one into memory, and we're just going to pipe some integers over to it. And you guys can see the begin block ran. Then it iterated through every object passed through the PowerShell pipeline, and then it finished up with the end block. Now, really, most of us don't use begin and end because we have no reason to, but hey, now you know it's there in case you ever do. All right, so let's play around a little bit here. I'm going to go ahead and do another one, but this time I'm going to leave the begin and the end blocks completely empty. As a matter of fact, I don't even need to have those there. I'm just having it up there so you guys can see where they're at, and I'm going to show you that this code works. Now, so far... Probably nothing unusual for you guys, but take a look at that keyword right here. That's one a lot of people don't know about. Filter. All right, so what's the difference between both of these? Technically speaking, it's a function, but it only has a process block. So I'm going to go ahead and do the literally the exact same thing I did up here. I'm going to read it in the memory, and I'm going to run it. Now, where does this information get stored? We have these things called PowerShell providers. 
PowerShell providers are pretty cool things. If you guys attended my last session, I got, sorry, I gotta fix this microphone. There we go. If you attended my last session, you saw we used the PowerShell providers to hunt down a computer virus. All right, well, there's a PowerShell provider called Function. So what I'm gonna do is enumerate the Function provider. And if you take a look, filters also land inside the Function provider. When I first saw the filter, I immediately started trying to hunt down where's the filter provider. I cannot tell you how long I spent going down the dead end until I just happened to call up the functions and I saw by default there's already a filter and they're called more. So really, which one should you actually use? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a test and this is not going to display any information. Both this filter and this function are gonna do the same thing. And the question I often get when we discover these filters is, so which one's faster? Which one do I use? Well, let's, uh, let's just do a little speed test here and find out. So it's iterating through these. It's sending roughly 200 integers. And as you can see, guys, there's really no difference. So if you need to use, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I just use filter anyhow, all right, for everything. I'm not, sorry, filter, function for everything. But for some people, they want to have some sort of differentiation for when you can have the begin and end and when you don't have to worry about it. Really, again, you don't have to put the begin and end block in a function. But if you guys want some more differentiation, as you can see, there is like zero time difference between the two. Use whatever works best for you. But remember, the filter only has a process block. It will, whatever you put in there will execute for each iteration. Yes, sir, go ahead. Be honest with you, I don't know. Too bad Jeffrey was in the last one. What you got? There you go. There you go. So there's your leftovers. Isn't it nice having the PowerShell team in the room? Go ahead. Can I add a param block to a filter? Well, you got the man right there. What do you say? Good. There we go. All right. Now, the other thing I get is when we have to, again, teach PowerShell and the PowerShell pipeline. How many of you struggled with the PowerShell pipeline when you first started learning it? Yeah, the whole dollar sign, PS item, dollar sign underscore. Yeah, because we've got to remember PowerShell was designed not for developers. How many of you who manage some type of a system went to college to learn how to break software? Okay, I did actually. Exactly. So, you know, we have to keep this context in mind. So when I'm delivering these classes, I have to remember that I have to teach the PowerShell pipeline from the beginning and have to describe what does this dollar sign underscore dollar sign PS item thing means? What exactly does it mean, by the way? What is it? I should have a little cricket sound thing going. Yeah, it's essentially that current object that we've received or that's moving through the PowerShell pipeline. Now, dollar sign underscores what we had prior to PowerShell 3, but um, they added this one called PS item in PowerShell 3. I guess that's more clear. Well, the question I get is, which one should I use? Well, it depends. Which one do you want to use? All right, so PowerShell 2, how many of you still have power? Don't be embarrassed. How many of you still have PowerShell 2 in your environments? There you go. So, yeah, you really can't move up to the PS item. Those of you who are beyond PowerShell 2, so the question is, which one to use? Well, let's play around a little bit here. I'm, oops, don't want to break. I'm going to go ahead and run one of my speed tests here. And let's see what happens when we do run this. And what you're going to see, green means it was faster. And generally, and granted, I got a few VMs. Oh, that's really weird. Usually, there we go, I get an even split, five for five. Okay, in this case, it looks like, yeah, it looks like dollar sign underscore accidentally went a little faster. No, seriously, though, almost every time I run this particular test, it gets an even split. I have not been able to find a performance difference. Yes, sir. There you go. Exactly. Yeah, so there it is. Do I have to switch over to PS item when I'm in PowerShell 3 or higher? No, you don't have to. You don't have to go reprogram all your code. 
All right, I personally, um, and now that someone's on the team's listening to me here, um, I personally still use dollar sign underscore just for the maximum compatibility. And when you publish things on the internet, this with means something. How much can you put on a one line? So I use that to kind of control how, about how wide my lines are. All right, so another one. What I like to do on Friday is I invite everybody to bring in a personal, simple project they would like to try. I do this on Monday because that way throughout the entire week, they're listening to what I'm saying and they're picking up ideas on how to do something that is going to be meaningful. And then, of course, we make sure we send that home with them. And all I do at the end of class, I go around and I coach them, kind of nudge them along the way. So we came across one, and this is one that caught me off guard, is that somebody was trying to use a parameter called input. Hmm. Okay, well, let's see what input actually does. I'm going to create a quick little array and a function to test it. And you can see inside this function, what it's going to do, first of all, is display the member information, and then it's going to expand the variable, and it should say one, two, three in it. So let's just see what this does. So it worked. Okay, that's cool. Let's do the same thing. I'm going to create an array called input, and I'm going to use it inside of an identical function. So right now, we should expect essentially identical information. Let's see what happens. Hmm, something's not right. Yeah, okay. Well, this is actually from one of the PowerShell help files. Let's see, input is actually one of our automatic variables. That means you probably should be using it as a parameter name. Contains an enumerator that enumerates all input that is passed to a function. Yeah, that that's explains a lot. Okay, the input variable is available only to functions and script blocks, which are unnamed functions, blah, 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 blah. You guys can read that file if you guys want. In other words, guess what? It's already being used. And I know it sounds really cool. Hey, I'm going to have a variable, a parameter called input. Probably not the best idea. So what is this weird thing? Well, let's go ahead and create another function. I'm just going to pipe to it and show you. Hey, that does work. Okay, didn't have to tell, hey, let's accept input from the PowerShell pipeline. All right, let's try it this way. Can I pipe information to it? Yes and no. We got the member information. It contained integers. I think we can all agree to that. But why didn't it display one, two, and three? It's because it's this little thing called an enumerator. It's not exactly, again, something that you probably want to be using as your actual input parameters. You can see if I execute a method called reset, then it works. So anytime that you actually look at it, you have to reset it if you're going to look at it again. So again, I would say probably not the best idea to use it. Here I'm going to create my array the right way. And you can see I'm executing um, my function. I'm asking it to give me the count property of an array, which is three. We have three elements in the array, right? Do that same thing here with input. Not quite right, is it? Did I repeat that? Yeah, I did. There we go. Okay, so guys, in other words, be careful when you're choosing your parameter names. Please do not use one of the automatic variables as one of your parameter names. They're there for a reason. All right, this one actually Jeffrey pointed out to me that I didn't fully read one of my help files, and I didn't have to write this command, this uh, uh, command called find parameters. I'm going to go ahead and put it in memory anyhow. All right. So what this one does is it simply tell, allows me to scan through the system and see any commandlet that has a particular parameter. I actually did this to demonstrate how many commandlets use the sim session parameter in it. So we can do some very lightweight, easy remoting to different systems. How many commandlets use what's called input object? How many of you have seen input object in the help files? Yeah, you're probably going to see them on things like sort object or select object. It's essentially maybe for the commandlets that are designed to accept pretty much any type of object. But really, you can see there's a lot more in there. Let's go ahead and measure it, find out how many is actually there. So 69, now I haven't loaded up all of my modules, and I also learned from last session, don't run this. So what I'm going to do is let's ask how many actually use input. Now, i got to warn you something, guys. I am using my local system. How many of you have a lot of modules loaded on your system? Liars. 
I know you do. You're in Azure all the time, Tom. All right, yeah, so I actually have... Did I not find one? Usually it pumps one up. Oh, I didn't do a full load of my modules. I actually found one. It was something I pulled off the PowerShell gallery. So somebody made a no-no, made a little boo-boo, and had a parameter called input. All right, so again, watch your parameter names. And again, when I do these PowerShell classes, one of my favorite things when I see in parameter names is when they use spaces in parameter names. What happens when you put a space in a parameter name? It doesn't work, right? Okay, yes, there is a way to do it. Don't. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more programmer, developer type stuff. So, this thing, hang on. So let's talk a little bit about some programmer stuff, some developer stuff. We have a, some people have come across this little variable called this. What is this? Well, I generally don't touch this until I do maybe more of an advanced PowerShell class. This actually lets us do things to this object we're working with right now. So I'm going to create an object in two different ways. Now, before anybody barks about how I'm doing it, how many different ways can you create an object in PowerShell? Can we settle on a lot, right? Okay, so I'm just going to do two totally, and I think we can agree, totally different ways of doing objects. You know, funny thing, when I was doing a demonstration in a Windows class, the way how I copy and paste is Control-C, Control-Charlie, copy, Control-Victor to paste, Control-V, right? This is when I got a response from somebody on audience. That's not how you do it. Huh? You press Control-C to copy, and then you right mouse click and select paste. That's how you do it right. So if I'm creating objects differently from you, I don't care. They work. Okay. So anyhow, this is actually one of the oldest ways I've created objects, but it lets me do some little extra here. I'm going to go ahead and create a new, totally blank PowerShell object. Let's see what it actually gave us here. BJ, I'm going to, whoops, my object. I'm going to pipe it to get member. And if we take a look here at my output, I probably should switch my view here. It's basically a blank PowerShell object. Okay, so let's create one here. I'm going to create one with a property called number, and it's going to have a value of 10. Now, when I take a look at it, there, you can see it has a property called number. It also gives us some other capability. Someone tell me what the, pro what the members of an object are. This is the audience participation section. Oh, shoot, it's a pop quiz. Didn't expect that before lunch, did you? No, I could have been worse. I could have done this after lunch. Okay, what's a property? It describes. That's right. Okay. What is an event? Something that occurs. Maybe an external force, as I like to call it. Something from the outside world triggers it. What's a method? I'm sorry? Yeah, not, not something the object can do. It can do it to itself. It may do it to something else. I'm going to go ahead and add in a method. And what I'm doing here is I'm adding a method with a single argument called add number. And simply take a look here. Where do you think this number property comes from? Yeah, it was defined. It's part of the object. I'm saying take this object's number property and add to it. Very basic stuff. So let's go ahead and give that a try. I'm going to go ahead and add that to my actual object. Let's take a look here at the object right now. Its current number value is 10. I'm going to execute the object's method called add number, give it 100, and you can see it acted on itself. The original one, we never changed. But we can still act on it. All right, so this essentially references back to the object that you're working with. Yes, sir. That, you'll have to ask the PowerShell team for that. Oh, hi, Bruce. Cool? All right. Bruce, I need to hire you to show up more often. All right. So 
looking at the objects members there it is it's been added in all right who's played around with classes yet okay cool all right i played around a little, a little bit with them actually by the time we get to this in my powershell class it's like thursday afternoon people's minds are blown so we actually stop doing normal stuff when we create battleships and lightsabers with classes you know just have a little fun but in this case Here's a really basic thing that you can take home with you on how to build a class. Now, again, we're keeping things really, really basic here in this demonstration. So my class will be this demo, and you'll see how we use it in a second. I have two constructors. One of them is what we call the default constructor. When you call that, remember, constructor creates the object and instantiates it, all right? So it basically creates it under its default context where our property called number will be nulled out. Or... I went ahead and just threw this one in there just for the fun of it. I created a second constructor. In this case, if I provide it an integer value, it will go ahead and create the object and it'll set this object's number property to whatever I give it. And you can see I went ahead and threw in another method. Essentially, it's gonna do the exact same thing we did in the other object, but this time we'll do it with classes. So I'll go ahead and put that in and let's take a look at how we can build a class. In this case, I'm going to call the new method. Now, if I take that 5 out of there, it'll create just a default one. But I'm going to leave it in there as part of our constructor. And I'm going to save that new object in something called fun with numbers. And there it is. And when we call the add number, it will take this object and add 10 to its number property. So hopefully that clarifies if anybody had any trouble with the this variable does for you it simply references back to myself as the object i'm currently working with is everybody good with that yeah a little little different stuff here huh now this one again another question and it took me a little time to figure this thing out opf output field separator what in the world is this thing well let's figure it out here first of all let's look at all the variables i have in memory right now and i'm going to scroll up my list here to the O's, and I do not see the OPF, OPS, excuse me. Not there, okay. Well, I'm gonna create a little array with four different strings. Let's expand out the array, just make sure we have one. I think we can all agree we have an array of strings. All right, let's convert that array to a string, and you can see it puts it into the pipeline all in the same line, but between the characters, there's a space, isn't there? Where did that come from? Well, let's see if that created our OFS, our output field separator, and it's still not there. All right. Let's just see if anything's actually there. Well, it didn't error. Let's ask for the ASCII code. ASCII code zero. What is ASCII code zero? Null. It's null, nothing. How in the world did I get a space from nothing? Well, hang on, let's play some more. I'm going to run that same uh, converting the array to a string. I'm going to grab the character between my names, that empty character. We're going to save it. Here's the character, just to verify we actually got that empty space. And let's ask for its ASCII character code. Which one's that? 32. It's the space. Okay, but guess what? We can set that output field separator. Now when I run get variable, there it is, OFS, it's now dash. Let's take a look at it. Now let's convert the array to a string. So now it's there. Now we can restore it back to null if we want to. So really this gives us the same, somewhat of the same functionality as the join operator inside of PowerShell. So again, I get this question often in my classes, what is faster? Well, let's see if we can figure something out. Um, who's read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea? And again, yeah, I know I do that too. I love that book. All right, so I'm going to read the entire text of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea into a file. Let's measure it. Now, in this particular one, um, the lines are actually paragraphs. They didn't do a uh, separator, a line separator after each sentence. So there's 2,746 paragraphs inside of this book. Let's uh, go ahead and just run, put this into a string. And, well, you can see, yeah, that worked. All right, let's do it one more time. Now, remember, that used the output field separator. All right, now we have one line and 106,000 words. So which one's faster? Do we use the output field separator or would you use the join command? 
Let's go ahead and do a little speed test here. Hmm, let's do it a few more times. And again, because I have like multiple VMs running, there we go. Most of the time, however, I actually thought when I first started doing this, I figured that most of the iterations, the OFS would have been faster. But again, it's what's happening in the background. So that's what that OFS thing stands for. And believe me, I did not know this until somebody pointed, me, pointed it out to me. Because when we run get variable, it's not even there, right? But when I try to do a little research, it says if the OFS is still set to null, not only are you not going to see it, but it will go ahead and inject ASCII code 32 to space when it's used. That's why it did not join all four, all four strings together without a space. It injected them in there. How many of you use breakpoints, PowerShell breakpoints to debug? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bruce. Hmm. Okay. There you go. You get it from the source. Thank you. But yeah, that one does came up in class. All right. PowerShell breakpoints. Again, who uses them? These are cool. Okay, how many of you use the right debug command? Okay. Yeah, and I use it too on occasion, but the thing is, um, if I have maybe 50 right debugs and I need to stop execution at number 48, what do I have to do? Yeah, there you go. Set PS breakpoint. A little bit easier. All right, so one of the problems I noticed that some people have is, is they forget when they're in a nested session. There's actually one of our automatic variables called nested prompt level. Right now it says you're not nested in anything. I'm going to go ahead and create a quick little function. And I'm going to set up a PowerShell breakpoint. Whenever the command let write warning is executed, we're going to suspend. Now the reason why we do this is, if I were to have some memory inside of here that I wanted to investigate, if I ran the function and it ended, what happened to that memory? Gone! This is a good thing, okay? All right, so those of you who've done any programming, have you ever had to manage your memory and clean up after yourselves? Yeah, I, yeah, brute, okay. Yeah, how many of us enjoy doing that? Oh, please. Okay, so here's the thing. If, if you have, okay, I'm not going to say anything bad about the fact I have an Android phone. If you have a phone like mine, all right, and he knows it's getting really, really slow, what do you think's going on in there? Probably one of your video games, I'm sorry, probably one of your productivity apps, okay? Um, they didn't clean up after themselves, all right? And it's called a memory leak. So this actually, um, by destroying all the memory when a scope closes, really helps you and I as non-programmers not make that mistake and consume memory because if we didn't if you if this was not done for us every time you ran it memory would be taken it ends not return to the operating system you run it again and again and you see the problem we're going to have here eventually you run out of ram so i'm going to go ahead and run test nested prompts and i just went into my debug mode now the cool thing about this is the script is still running so memory is still present and what i can actually do is go in here and I can evaluate memory and uh, let's see here. You know what, I probably should have put a variable in here. Let me exit out real quick. We're gonna create a variable data is equal to hello. And then at the end here, right, output data. Oh, okay, I think we all know that's gonna do, right? Let me reread this in the memory. That way we have some memory to explore. All right, test the nested prompt levels, we're gonna run it. First of all, let's look at our nested prompt level. Remember before zero, now we can see we're inside of a prompt. Now believe it or not, if you look, we had a few changes here. There's a different prompt to it. There's an extra little carrot as we sometimes call it. That still doesn't seem to be enough for some people. So I actually asked them to go ahead and check their nested prompt level and they realized, oh shoot, I'm still running my code. Now for the neat thing about this is, for those of you who haven't tried it, the value of data is currently hello. Well, I think that might be the source of my problem. Really, what's a logic error? You all have had them, don't lie. What's a logic error? Usually, 
It's when the value of memory is something other than what you expected it to be. Isn't that true? Your output, the value of memory isn't what you expect. Whose fault's that? It's Bruce. It's Bruce's. All right, so anyhow, data is now equal to hello world. I'm going to go ahead and let that sink in. I'm going to exit my debug mode, which allows program execution to continue. You can see that is one way how we can test if my memory should have been something else. We can look at it, we can change it, and we can let it continue. That's what a PowerShell breakpoint does for you. So don't look up new PS breakpoint. It's set PS breakpoint to create them, all right? By the way, once we've exited out, nested prompt level back down to zero. So we're no longer executing our code. It's all done. All right, I'm going to go ahead and remove all the PowerShell breakpoints from memory so they don't interfere with anything else we're going to do. Any questions on that? Yeah, it's about lunchtime, isn't it? Okay, so for me, for write debug, when you flag for debug, you stop at every one, don't you? At every write debug. So again, imagine if you have like 50 right debugs and you have to stop at number 48 and you accidentally click yes to continue on 48, you have to start over. The PowerShell breakpoints are very dynamic. We can actually set it up for maybe an action. So when a variable exceeds a certain value or hits a certain number, then we can break. We can do it on commandlet. You can also do it on line number. And as long as you have your script saved, I'll be honest with you, F9, will set a line breakpoint. Let me show you real quick. Get PS breakpoint. Come on, tab completion. This is why I get for having so many modules loaded up in memory at the same time. Get PS breakpoint. Do it. I guess it's faster for me to type today. Awesome. I blame Yap. He was on my machine on the demonstration earlier. There it is. And you can see I've got a automatically created a line breakpoint. But before you can do a line breakpoint, either in the ISC or manually, the script has to be saved. And you have to you can see you missed a find that PS1 is the name of the script. I'm gonna go ahead and F9. You can have as many breakpoints, line breakpoints as you need. I'm just gonna F9 to take that off. If we were running the code, by the way, when we hit that breakpoint in the ISC, it would turn orange. Yes, sir, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's sweet. Why aren't you presenting that? Yeah, another neat thing is breakpoints are objects. They have a property called enabled. Guess what you can do? Set it to disabled. You don't lose any of your breakpoints and it doesn't stop the code. If it still doesn't work, get PS breakpoint, pipe to enable PS breakpoint. They're all turned back on again. So they're pretty cool things. Guys, take a look at them. Particularly, you know, the right debug is really cool, but also I don't want my users invoking it on accident. Um, but also, um, it's, again, very dynamic in its nature. So when you have larger scripts, I tend to use the breakpoints. Okay, so let's talk about the most exciting topic called string manipulation. Who works with strings? Say, so you all work with strings, come on. I know, this is not exactly, let's face it, the most sexy topic on the, pro on the planet, but there's a reason why I teach it. All right, so TechNet was made for you and I. Who likes Star Wars? Don't lie. All right, we're going to cross to the dark side now. We need to go to MSDN. So, here we go. Let's go over. Awesome, lost my internet. I'm on the, no, I'm not on the internet anymore. I was connected. Okay, so there's this neat little website at Microsoft that lets us see the members of a string object. And unfortunately, we're not going to do that. Well, hey, hang on. It's still spinning. There we go. So the string class. Let's go down to its methods. I take time to teach methods here because of some past experiences I've had. Now, first of all, there's a lot of methods. The methods, again, are basically little pieces of free software built into a string object. Neat thing about methods I really like, you don't have to develop them, you don't debug them, you don't have to support them. That's Microsoft's job, right? So that's software that's free to use. All right, so if you go through here, there's a lot of cool functionality built in to help us hunt for information. 
How many of you have to look at event logs? Exactly. So here's the thing. If I'm trying to set up a trap, I'm sorry, not a trap. If I'm trying to discover somebody's trying to run around my system looking at things they shouldn't, I'm probably going to do a little auditing on it, right? But I don't want to sit there and go through 500 server event logs every day because it's not happening. So what we could technically do is write a little PowerShell code that, oops, to tell us when somebody, where did my code just go? There it is. To tell us maybe we're capturing for a specific event. Hang on a second. <coughs> Speaking of All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up event 4634. I use this event from the security log because I know it's always there. I'm going to pull up the message component and just show you guys what it looks like. This is one of the uh, ad hoc exercises I do in my PowerShell class. There we go. So let's say, for example, let's not care why. Don't care why. Let's say when this event's triggered, the piece of information that we need reported to us is the account name. By the way, on occasion, that account name has a dollar sign at the end of it. We don't want it. So what I challenge my class to do is give me that piece of information, in this case, JSON, nothing else. And it's remarkably easy how you can do it using string manipulation. Let's take a look. So first of all, I'm going to save that message in a variable called data just to make this a little more readable. Now, if we ask it, is it a variable, is it an array? Yeah, with one element. So what I'm going to do is use the split method, and that is a backtick n. What does that do? New line, that's right. So let's go ahead and run that. Does not look any different, does it? But if I call its count property, we now have 11 lines. The fifth element in the array, or index number four, I just got rid of a whole bunch of stuff now, didn't I? So let's go ahead and continue to chop away at this. So I see there's some extra characters, account name colon. I'm going to call another method of the string object called replace. I'm going to replace account name colon with nothing. It's gone. Had I had a dollar sign at the end of this, I could do the same thing. And now I can see that I definitely have some uh, white space at the beginning, and I don't know if there's any at the end. So I'm going to call trim without anything else. And you can see I've now filtered that entire message out to only the piece of data I need to return back to me. So one of the challenges I have for uh, my classes is, yes, go ahead. Um, we could try with regex, but there's two JSONs up there in that. So it would be quicker. Why don't we afterwards, why don't we give it a try? And we'll see, okay? Yeah, for those of you who don't know, I actually do exit the classroom and try these questions with you. So feel free to step out there if you got any more. One of the challenges I have them do is to actually use string manipulation so we learn how to use methods and find answers. And I also tell people, if your answer doesn't match mine, it's okay, does it work? Well, guess what? Here are some of the answers and you can see we've had quite a few, but in the end, are they all correct? Yes, they are. So definitely take a look at methods. Now, really the reason why I do this is because I've had to face situations where I've had text-based log files. Now, when you type in what get when event or get event log, you get this beautiful object thing, right? It's got these neat little properties, makes it really easy for you to hunt information down. What if it is one consistent text file? Yeah, do you see the problem here? So here's the deal, this is a funny story. Um, when I arrived at a software, or software, an engineering company in Indianapolis, um, they were really nice to me. Doesn't that scare you when they're nice to the IT people? So they handed me the keys to the software cabinet. This is day one. I'm like, okay, this is a little different. So I found where it's at. They were so nice to me. They had the doors already unlocked. They were so nice to me that I opened up the cabinets. Well, they forgot to clean the dust bunnies, but everything else was gone. There was no software. So I filled out an inventory, no software, handed it off to the manager and goes, well, you're supposed to track this stuff. You do understand this is my first day of work, right? Does anybody see the problem we're about to have here? So what happened is, is that we had a major piracy issue. You see, I was in an organization where everybody had to have local admin rights. Awesome, right? So I raised a little stink about it and I was told, don't worry about it, <laughs> sign here. I just want you to know that I actually complained. So it's not on my shoulders. 
About a year or so later, one of her engineers was fired. Guess what he did? He called Autodesk. Guess what came in my mail? A bunch of stuff from lawyers. So I had to uninstall everything. Oh, by the way, that meant that um, multi-million dollar projects just grinded to a screeching halt. The solution from management was let's deploy a license server. Cool. But here's the thing. You get the, yeah, his eyes just got really big. Okay. No, no. When I point to you, it's fine. Okay. But when I go up here and do the knife hand, that's a problem. All right. So you get to use a 30% of the time. You 30%. You, I like you, 40. Oh, look, that's one license. These people need 24-7, 365. Guess what happened? Yeah, two-thirds of the company couldn't work. All right, so here's the deal. What I had to prove to them how bad of an idea this was. The Autodesk license file at the time was text-based. I had to write the code to convert it to an object. How do you think I did it? String manipulation, right? Neat thing is I was able to prove to management that in order to not spend a six-figure bill, they were about to get hit with multiple seven- and eight-figure penalties. All right. It took about two weeks until they realized it, but because we were able to analyze it and then pipe it and make it a web page for them to look at, they might know a command that we're talking about, convert to HTML. We had a refreshing every five minutes so they can see how bad of an idea they had, bought the license files, and saved us from having, let's just say, a lot of problems. Regex. We're getting to it now, okay? Cool. Okay, there you go. All right. So... And by the way, guys, out on my blog, if you type Jason Yoder in Google, you will straight to it. I've got complete instructions. If you are faced with a text-based log file, I have instructions out there how to use PowerShell to get it into the format we like. All right, let's play around a little bit with regular expressions. Now, I know at least one person in the audience uses it. Anybody else? Absolutely. These things are cool. All right, so let's just play a little bit here. I'm going to create a string, and you can see I'm looking for a particular account numbers. How many of you are worried about maybe certain information being where it should not be? Sometimes? All right. I don't know if you realize this. In the United States, I think we have more lawyers than anybody else, okay? So we need to protect ourselves here. If you take a look at it, there's a health file about regular expressions. It describes what I have up here. DD, that's two numbers, followed by a dash, followed by three numbers. Did we find one? Yes, we did. What was it? And, well, it extracted out the first of the two. Okay. Well, I'm going to play a little deeper here. We're going to create a regex object, system.regex. We're going to dive into a little .NET here. All right, we can see it's got a lot of neat methods. Remember, methods free software. All right, we're going to define our regular expression, and we're going to see if there's any matches. And by golly, we can pull out every match that's on there. So again, we can hunt things down if we need to. So could we do that with regular expressions? Prop the other thing. Yes, we could but not at that point in my class. <laughs> All right, so let's play around a little bit more. If we want the values of what it found, we can actually do that. So how can we, again, look at a huge document? Did you guys know that your Word documents, if you what, rename them to a ZIP, you can crack those suckers open and examine them? So maybe we can do things like hunt down social security numbers. In this case, we're going to read in 20,000 leaves under the sea. And if you can formulate the regular expression, like, for example, if we want to know the location of the Nautilus a couple times in the book, that's the formula that they use. Now, mind you, this is a big book. Look how fast we're able to scan through and look for critical information based on patterns. Every once in a while, they report temperatures. So it would be some unknown number of digits followed by that little tiny circle degree symbol space, sometimes some unknown number of words followed by a zero. Can we find those? Yes, we can. And also, sometimes the speed is represented not in numbers, but in an unknown number of words, followed by the word knots. All right, for those of you who don't go out on the ocean, that's how fast we measure things. All right, we do things that way to confuse you land lovers. All right, so here we go. You can see we can pull those out. So again, we have ways of using regular expressions to find patterns, extract that data. So I may scan documents to see if, at least in the United States, three digits, dash one, or dash two digits, dash four digits. We call that social security numbers. That's bad if they leak out. I have a neighbor, um, his, his uh, health care information was leaked. 
Guess what? He doesn't work anymore. He lives on the settlement checks. I really wish I was that guy. All right, so another one here, parameters. Let's take a look at some parameters. How can we use these? I see my time is just about up. How much do I have left? 15? Okay, we're good. We're good. Cut me off when you need to. I'm giving you guys the code anyhow. All right, so I'm going to test the parameter here, and you can see it actually works. All right, we just simply use the param keyword and declared, and I'm keeping things really basic here. All right, what if we wanted to know if a parameter was used or not? So I'm just putting it into an if-else statement. If the parameter is used, display it. If not, ask if I forgot something. Okay, that's cool. Let's see if it works with null. Now up here, I actually used uh, empty string. Let's see if it works with null. So I'm gonna read it in real quick. Test params, that worked. Oh, not quite. All right, well, let's try something else here. What about integer values? What if we give you an integer under the same context? That worked. Wait, it gave me a zero? So one of the things to try to get is maybe a consistent way of determining if a parameter was actually used or not, so we don't have to try all this debugging and different methods. So there is a variable called PS bound parameters. It's a hash table. What's a hash table? There you go, a dictionary. It has a key, it has a value, it has a key, okay. So our keys are actually the names of our parameters. So I can actually ask this hash table, does it contain one of my parameter names? If so, let's use it. Let's give it a try. That works, and that works. Does it work with integer values? That works, that works. Hey, I think we might have found something that actually works. All right, so again, I'm just showing this to you so that you have a different way of determining whether somebody used one of the parameters in the commandlets that you've written. All right, root, yes. Um, mm -hmm. But that's what we essentially did here, but between string and integer, we had to do it different ways. Oh, if you do what? If the param, okay, so if parameter, nothing else. So we're going to pull away from the common parameter or variable here and try something different. So you want to say, I'm going to actually put this in different one function, test one. And we're going to give it a parameter of, oops, test. And you want to say if, if test, All right, there's hello, else. Speed it up here a little. Else, and I don't put a comparison on it. Else, I. So we'll go ahead and put it in the memory. We'll run test one. That works too. Yeah, but this one is the reason I show this is to show the automatic variable. And I'm, you know, I'll be honest with you, um, and I'm not going to say which author. I do have a pre-copy of his book, uses the method I just showed you. So that's kind of where, at least that individual, I won't say who is leaning towards. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, so you want to try this with an integer value as well? Okay, so test. So I'm going to go ahead and cast this as an integer value. And you just want to see whether or not it works right now. i got to put it back into memory. We'll try this one more thing than the rest we need to handle out there. All right, so yeah, it looks like it worked with an energy. Okay, a quick question. I've never tried to read them from a debug. So you want to enter a deep, quick debug and see? I'm going to put a line break point up on this one. And, ooh, it did not work. Probably would help if I hit the right key. There we go. And F8. And it's not breaking. It doesn't like right output, does it? Parameter A. Let's make sure this is functional. Yeah, it is running. All right, I tell you what, let's code this afterwards, okay? Because like I said, I think I'm about to be kicked off stage. All right. All right, guys, so the rest of the code, I'm only going to describe it real quick. Parameter sets. Instead of writing two different, very close together commandlets, 
because the function out of this one cannot be done at the same time as this, consider using a parameter set. If you type in for the help file get date, you'll notice there's two different syntax blocks. Format is in one, U formats in the other. They cannot be used the same way. So this code will demonstrate to you how to create what's called a parameter set. That way you don't have to write two separate but very similar commandlets. You can maintain one set of code. Um, error handling, I put a thing in here about some advanced error handling. I did not use the error variable parameter. I used the general one, but you can also use error variable. It involves with creating customized error messages because in that try block, a commandlet or commandlets piped together can each produce different types of errors. We can write code to detect which one errored, what the error was, and then possibly a fix to let things continue on. So the rest of this code here steps you through on how to create code that has multiple error catches on it based on the .NET framework object that comes out of it. And one more here, guys, that I had up here was the working with passwords and storing them out on disk. Again, I try to avoid doing this, but using some EFS encryption and some of the techniques that many of you have already seen in some demonstrations, at least I will do this for a test environment. More than likely, I would not do it for production, but you can see if we need to provide a script with elevated credentials, there are ways to do this. Just remember this line, 821. If you leave your machine and that credential's in memory, I can just type that and get the credential in plain text. So again, always be careful and practice good security measures. And one last thing I didn't get to here, the PowerShell script analyzer, anybody use it? All right, take a look at it. It might point out some bad things you're doing, okay? Now, the PowerShell script analyzer is based on some best practices that are out in the industry. It doesn't always mean that you have to follow it, but it's going to give you some really good ideas on how to improve code. The one I was going to do here was going to point out that I used a plural noun in my commandlet, and I accidentally used two aliases in the script, which is considered bad form. Okay, guys, sorry I couldn't continue to go all the way through this stuff. Oh, there's another one here on the using scope. But if we go over here to the slide deck, get your cameras out real quickly, and... Right there are the two links. The first one is for this topic. For those of you my other topic, we forgot to put it up. That is where you download all the source code. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter. Anytime I blog updates, you get an update notice on Twitter. Also, if you've got a team of people who need to start learning PowerShell, go ahead and give me a call. We can, do the, we can go on site through the official Microsoft class that I helped develop or we can do a customized class for you to help get all your people up to speed on PowerShell. Guys, sorry for holding you late. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, I will be outside.